Well, a good afternoon. Uh, I'm Marvin Weinbaum, a director of the Afghanistan and Pakistan studies here at the Middle East Institute. And we're pleased to welcome you uh, to a, today's panel discussion in which we're, we're going to be looking for some best ways forward in Afghanistan. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, uh, it's almost six months ago since President Trump uh, announced uh, what our strategy would be for Afghanistan. And uh, this was obviously intended to provide clarity here as to what our objectives are and how we choose to, to meet those objectives. Uh, I must say, and you'll probably agree, that uh, after this period of time, there still is some confusion. There still is some doubts here, uh, although I think we'd also say there have been some signs of progress. There are also some disconcerting developments, especially in the last few weeks, which uh, have raised all kinds of questions about what's the best way forward. So I, I'm just so pleased that we have the panel that we have today. Uh, I couldn't have picked a better panel. <laughs> and uh, I... Uh, what else would you say here? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Uh, so let me get started very quickly because we want to have as much time as possible. This is going to be a, a, a discussion in which later you're going to be asked or invited to join in. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's going to be one in which is framed around some of the questions that I'm going to ask the panelists. So let me introduce then the panelists. Off to my left here we have uh, Ahmed Majid Yar my valued colleague, colleague here at MEI. Uh, Ahmed uh, has been observing the region closely. Uh, his origins are Afghanistan. Uh, but most of you know him for his Iran Observe, which is a daily uh, net internet uh, <clears throat> newsletter, in effect, about uh, Iran's foreign policy. But uh, I just, as I say, value, value uh, his contribution here uh, on not just Iran, but Afghanistan and Pakistan as well. He was previously with the American uh, Enterprise Institute. And so uh, uh, thank you for joining us, Ahmed. Thank you. Uh, Ron Newman, Ambassador Ron Newman, to my near left. Uh, you know, Ron, Ron has been following the region since the late 1960s. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you were on that hippie tra trail, as I recall you're saying, you know, with that micro bus that would go across. Uh, <laughs> My legend is growing outside of reality. But, uh, <laughs> I didn't suggest that you were indulging in the things that the, the hippies did then, because they were quite outlandish in some of the behavior, which I saw firsthand myself. So uh, Ron has been our ambassador uh, to Afghanistan and follows Iran, uh, Afghanistan about as closely as anyone does today. He's uh, the president of the uh, American uh, Institute, what is it? Academy. Uh, American Academy of Diplomacy. Yeah. And uh, thank you for joining us, Ron. Uh, to my near right is Chris Kalenda. And Chris is an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for New American Security. Uh, and he served uh, as a senior advisor on Afghanistan and Pakistan to the Department of Defense. And he's had four tours, yes, in Afghanistan. That certainly makes you a veteran. <laughs> uh, I know that you've also served in as assistant professor of history at West Point. Well, we could, we could go on. And then my far right uh, dear friend, uh, Van der Felbach Brown from uh, Brookings. Uh, and Van der is, you know, some of us call her the drug lady. 
Vanda is a, has about as much expertise today on drug trafficking and, and the politics of, the, of drugs and, uh, as anyone uh, across, you know, not just in Afghanistan, but we particularly value her work here in Afghanistan. Uh, a recent book of hers has been especially well received. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining us. So, uh, just before, though, I'm asked to do some, something in the way of housekeeping here, if I can find the note here on this. Um, Yeah, okay. Um, well, I don't seem to find Never it here. Mind. Yeah, but, but I will say this, that, and this is what, the gist of what, the, what it was. Uh, as you know, we're in the process here of renovating and expanding our Middle East Institute, which, as you know, is around the corner. And that, uh, that process will go on for a little while yet, but this also coincides with a fundraising campaign that MEI is undertaking uh, so that we can offer the kind of facility that we really look forward to. And that facility, by the way, is going to have an art gallery. It's going to have an auditorium which is considerably larger than this one. So in many, uh, in many ways, we're going to be able to expand our activities which are already pretty expansive. So as you leave, you'll find there's a pledge card if you, and we would invite you to take one and, and contribute if you can uh, so that we can uh, make this uh, what it is already and that is a place to go for what's happening in the Middle East uh, and we want to make it ever more so uh, as in the years to go forward. So let's now get started and I'm going to raise the first question then. We've heard from the Trump administration and the military that we're in it to win. So I'm asking what would winning look like in Afghanistan? And how, how what does our presence being conditioned, based, what does that mean? So, please, with no particular order here, who'd like to start us off? Ron? Okay. <laughs> Not the first time I've been volunteered. Um, I think the Trump administration actually has arrived at a fairly decent policy, miserably explained. Uh, you are certainly right about the lack of clarity. I lecture regularly to people going to Afghanistan. I think for at least the last four classes, I've asked for a show of hands of those who feel comfortable that they understand the policy. No hands have ever gone up. Um, and that's a shame because actually, I think there are a couple of things that go to your question. In the president's speech, he talks about no um, no attacks on the United States based out of Afghanistan. This actually reminds me of a much more articulate, articulated version of that that Chris uh, superintended in his paper, uh, which talked about changing the strategy from one of some undefined victory to removing terrorist threats to the United States. That is a definition of success. It is far less than, first of all, it's far less than surrender on the deck of the Missouri. And secondly, it, it has in it the potential of a continued level of some level of, content, of conflict. It's not peace necessarily. You can, I won't do the argument of whether or not it's a good definition. It may be the only credible definition of success you can have in fighting a non-state actor that has a regenerative capacity. Clear victory is not going to, I think, be an option. And that's a problem for Americans because we have a definition of victory in our heads, sort of comes out of World War II, and if that's your definition of victory, 
then you probably can't have it in dealing with any non-state actor that has regenerative capacity, in which case you have defined permanent failure. That would be a problem. So I think there is a definition of victory there, of success, not victory really. Uh, I think you can argue for it as meeting strategic purpose, mm. but I think if you, I think first of all, they have an enormous responsibility to clarify that. And secondly, if you, uh, if that is the goal, and if one accepts it, then you are accepting a very long-term commitment. And then there's a very, there's a sentence in the president's speech talks about sort of this isn't a blank check. This brings one to I, what I think is an inevitable element of tension in any policy if you're not going to leave Afghanistan. And that is the recognition that the Afghan government has to do better, it has to clean up its act in some very important areas. If they don't do that, particularly immediately in the military, if you have ineffective military based on political appointments, which we have seen in other wars, then no matter what we do, we would fail. And so that means you have, it, have to have some element of conditionality. And at the same time, you really have to get away from these bloody, stupid time deadlines that the Obama administration continually stuck on the policy, which was almost fatal to it. And so you can't get, you can't, I don't think you can get away from having that element of tension in any Afghan policy. And clearly, that kind of nuance is going to be really rough to explain in short public comments. And I don't think they've done it at all. So what you've got is my interpretation, not theirs. But I think that's where you are on those. I think that's actually the reality of where you are on those two points. Who'd like to jump in now? Vanda. You know, this notion that our principal goal is to avoiding uh, attack on the United States or perhaps US assets have, of course, been the core objective for all three administrations. Where I think the Trump administration is struggling with the very same issues that the Bush administration, the Obama administration deeply struggled, oscillated, and really at the end didn't resolve is the same issue. Well, what brings us to it? What kind of conflict, what kind of arrangement uh, is necessary to avoid it? What's the role of safe havens? Is it okay that the Taliban controls maybe southern Afghanistan? What levels of areas are there? Uh, what if there is conflict, there is no direct control, will that allow the preservation of safe havens? So, you know, the goal, no attack on, uh, and what does it require to assure uh, that objective of no attack on the United States or, or perhaps uh, more, more expansively U.S. As assets? Is simply destroying enough of um, the militants, whoever they are, whether they are Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, uh, these days ISIS Khorasan, enough? Can that be accomplished through military, uh, through bombing or through military action alone? Or do you need to put in some viable uh, governance. And the Trump administration has not resolved the issues. I would very much posit that um, the military action alone is not adequate, that uh, there needs to be um, critical focus on governance. And uh, again, the president comments uh, I don't think are very helpful. In, in the August speech, he, in fact, very explicitly said, uh, well, uh, what happens internally in terms of politics is not our business. We will not be uh, messing in that. The, uh, his other administration officials later on very much tried to walk these comments uh, back. And yet very recently, uh, President Trump said there are no negotiations with the Taliban. We will not um, sanction that, which... Uh, it was very much of a news to uh, a lot of uh, people into the region, including, I would posit, very much of a major news to the Afghan government, and they probably were quite struck by that brief. Um, so while uh, there is um, perhaps clarity on the fundamental objective for all three administrations that continues to be real difficulty in resolving what it takes to get to that objective. Can there be a negotiated deal with the Taliban? What can it look like? I also want to- That's uh, our next question, by the way. <laughs> I also want to come to the issue of, of deadlines. And, and yes, the deadlines that the Trump administration was imposing turned out to be very counterproductive and quite um, destabilizing. But let's understand a crucial impetus why they were put in place. 
namely to get the Afghans to recognize they need, that they need to put their house in order, that they cannot forever rely on the international community, and worse than just rely, that they cannot continue forever rocking the boat, engaging in brinks mentioning, engaging in fundamental misgovernance, corruption, power abuse, and constant politicking in Kabul that translates into allowing the potency, regeneration, and entrenchment that the Taliban has. Now, putting in the deadlines didn't accomplish that. However, I am not persuaded uh, at all, and in fact quite skeptical of the opposite proposition, then simply indicated the long-term commitment and saying, well, what happens internally is your business is equally problematic. Um, Robin? Yeah. Um, I think that the United States has had two vital interests in Afghanistan, and that ha um, these two vital interests have not changed over the past 16 years. The first one is, of course, as other speakers mentioned, is to uh, avoid Afghanistan descending into chaos and anarchy again, that it becomes a launchpad for terrorist attacks against the United States and its allies again. And the second vital interest, which is not mentioned often, is also t the safety of uh, Pakistan's uh, uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, of course, if Afghanistan becomes more destabilized, that will have its uh, 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 negative impact on Pakistan's stability as well. And as far as the success is concerned, I think uh, success in Afghanistan for the United States would be to enable the Afghan government uh, to uh, control and govern its territory and police its border with very minimal foreign assistance. Uh, and I think that, uh, as Ambassador Newman alluded to, there has been some progress in Afghanistan. Uh, of course, we are always talking about the challenges, uh, but we don't talk that, uh, about uh, one that Ambassador Newman mentioned. There has not been any major terrorist attacks uh, on the U.S. soil emanating from Afghanistan and the U.S. military and intelligence presence in Afghanistan was key to uh, degrading Al-Qaeda core in the AFPAC region. And also it is the U.S. military and intelligence presence now in Afghanistan which is countering the emerging threat of ISIS in Afghanistan as well. But of course, uh, uh, to build on these gains, uh, the United States and international community needs to further strengthen the Afghan uh, military and civilian institutions uh, degrade the Taliban, which has gained momentum recently, and also forge a regional consensus for uh, cooperation uh, on a stable and prosperous Afghanistan, that Afghanistan is not a battlefield for proxy war, but it is a hub for regional connectivity. And regarding the conditions based, I think that uh, the uh, Obama administration's timeline, they undermined both the military mission and the diplomatic mission in Afghanistan. Uh, it emboldened the Taliban that a military victory is possible and the United States is soon to leave Afghanistan. Uh, it also sent a negative message to friends and allies inside Afghanistan and the region. We saw that NATO followed suit and they withdrew their troops from uh, the country. And also I remember the Taliban were repeating that mantra that the United States have watched, we have the time, so we can outlast the US. And based on that recognition, the Trump administration has changed those time-based approach to a more conditions-based <coughs> approach. Um, and lastly, um, I agree with uh, Vanda that the uh, Obama administration meant to put pressure on the Afghan government uh, to uh, uh, bring about more effective governance and tackle corruption issues, but the outcome of the timelines were negative. We saw that corruption becomes more endemic. Uh, the Afghan leaders, businesses, they started to send their capitals to Dubai and other regions instead of just keeping it in Afghanistan, because the year 2014 had become the year of doom and gloom. So everybody was just hedging their bets. And I was in Pakistan, I remember I spoke to a, a former head of ISI, and uh, he talked about some of Pakistan's uh, concerns in Afghanistan, and I asked him that why you're not following that with the Afghan government to address them. And he said, well, the US, uh, the US is leaving, and we are not sure about this political system in Afghanistan. So that also discouraged Pakistan to play a more effective role. Uh, so that's why I think that this shift from time-based time to condition-based is the right approach. Well, would you agree that uh, condition-based doesn't mean unconditional staying? That is not an indefinite commitment. It does imply, in fact, that we'll make our decision based on the circumstances 
as they emerge. And I think uh, some people at least have read that, well, we're there for forever because of uh, not having given up on the timelines, therefore there is no time basis yeah, here for a, So I think that we ought to have that on the table. Chris. Um, so what does winning look like? Well, it's very simple. You lay out your, you identify your interests, the reasons why you went to war, and winning looks like your ability to achieve those interests. And there are three ways that, there are three methods by which wars can end in a country achieving its interest. First of all, they can end in decisive victory, right, Ron? Besser Newman mentioned surrender ceremony on the battleship Missouri. Certainly the most desirable way to end a conflict, uh, but may not always be the most realistic, particularly in these kind of conflicts. Two other ways that wars can end in a successful outcome are to transition. Uh, if you're an intervening power, you can work together with the host nation government and at some point transition the responsibility for winning the war to the host nation government and you leave, which is what the Obama administration tried to do with their approach. The third approach is to get a negotiated outcome. And a negotiated outcome that achieves your interest is by definition a win. That's what winning looks like. Yeah, that, that's a perfect, but, but, yeah, please but, come in. I want to get, I want to yeah. get in something yeah. before, yeah. You seg <laughs> before you segue, obviously, to <laughs> negotiations where Chris has given you this wonderful yeah, opening. Indeed he has. Um, First of all, I, I want to agree with Vonda, we do that often, um, that every administration has struggled with what this looks like. I would differ slightly on saying there is nothing there because there is, I think they called it a compact and maybe now it's an executive agreement. There's a, it's a multi-page um, spreadsheet of things they're supposed to be doing in timelines. I don't necessarily think it has total reality, but it exists. I think the big question when you want to do conditionality is a question of political will. And it's a question of judgment, and it's always going to be excruciatingly <laughs> difficult because these things will never be sufficiently clear to be automatic. There will always be a tendency to say, well, we should give it more time or stay, no matter what happens. So there, there will always be a tension. That tension leads me just to note that where we are now with this policy, I think, should be much more a debate about execution than a debate about policy. They have bought into a policy which is going to take a long time to do. And they're doing a miserable job, by the way, of explaining that. I mean, I've looked at some of the unclassified but internal charts of what you're supposed to get out of the military, the increase in advising and training. And where you see that showing up in our expectation, which could well be exaggerated, um, is well into 2019 or 2020 because that's what it takes to make changes in training and leadership, assuming you don't undercut the process by lack of political will. So, you know, it's, we need to understand, and this is gonna be really hard to do from America, is to track the kind of things that tell you actually whether you're making progress or not, because they're gonna be in the details of execution and not the big pieces of policy. Uh, before we go on to the next question, I see a number of seats down front here, so please, uh, please take, we're giving you a little time here to find a seat. There are two down here, one over there, two over here. Please join us. Marvin, can I come uh, to the question sure. of, of conditions? Yeah, uh, that, quickly. That, that okay, you um, yeah. Uh, raised. Uh, you know, I think that a lot of the focus is on under what conditions uh, are we successful, in particular in the handover that um, Chris spoke about, how do we measure those? I would posit that it is imperative um, that the United States as a society, the administration as the government, um, answers the questions under what conditions we leave. And those conditions are not simply when we have reached the stage of victory, but at what point Afghanistan has really not become a viable partner. At what point it's merely an illusion that um, uh, we will persist and, and hope that things break. We are currently in a policy 
that is staying and hoping that the Taliban will make enough mistakes and that the Afghan government will finally, and the Af not just government, but crucially the Afghan political class will finally start behaving. We have not yet resolved how to create inducements uh, for either side to move from that hoping, praying strategy. It is the least bad strategy. If we leave today, we will have a very nasty, bloody civil war on our hands. We have responsibility for avoiding that civil war. But we also have to think very hard is at what point we are simply not going to achieve uh, even a modicum of objectives. In my view, they are um, the Afghan security actors, Afghan military split along ethnic lines. There is a very protracted um, political crisis over the 2019 political elections. I can guarantee that there will be one. I am going to be daring. I can make bets with you. The question is That's how not, protracted uh, it will become and whether it will spill into actual violence, whether this is going to set actual civil strife. That for me would be one of the very crucial triggers when we say we are no longer uh, we are no longer staying, and I think there are several others. I, I will not preempt the the, uh, the time, but I just want to highlight: it's not enough to say when when things are good enough that we hang, that we can leave because things are good enough, but things are bad enough that we shouldn't be staying. I'm going to do yeah. two yeah. fingers on yes, that one. Yes. So I'm going to um, Street. just want to build on what Fonda said because I think it's really important. Look, there there are three ways wars end: decisive victory, transition, negotiated outcome. And part of the responsibility for policymakers and people doing strategy is to evaluate which one is which one of those options, which one of those methods for concluding the war successfully has the most realistic chance of leading to a favorable and durable outcome at the least possible cost in blood, treasure, and time. So you can take each of these three and, and you can look at, well, ex what are the prospects of decisive victory? What actually are the prospects of uh, the Taliban surrendering or ceasing to exist? And you can evaluate those possibilities. You can also examine the possibilities of what, what, uh, what is the likelihood that we will achieve this sort of what people call this crossover point where the Afghan government achieves this position of dominance over the Taliban and the Taliban are degraded uh, to the point at which the Afghan government can then defeat them decisively and we can leave. You can evaluate the likelihood of the probability of that occurring. In fact, we've already had a run at that uh, for the last 17 years. And then you can look at the probability that a negotiated outcome will meet your interests because ultimately you go to war to, to meet your interests. And, and as my colleagues have said, we've said our interests are making sure Afghanistan is no longer a launching pad for Al-Qaeda or other groups to, to stage large-scale attacks against the United States and our allies. Uh, we've certainly talked about Afghanistan being at peace with itself and with its neighbors. And we've talked about, we, we've spent a lot of time talking about human rights in Afghanistan. And to the extent to which, when you look at these three options, you evaluate to what extent am I going to achieve those interests realistically of these three options. One might be more desirable than others, but the key is which one is the most realistic, and that's what we need to evaluate. Thank you. I'm going to combine the next two questions because they are so closely related, and we're also loquacious group up here, so we'll have to recognize that. One of the criticisms that one hears all the time is that uh, we really have not given the proper focus on a diplomatic approach, on seeking a, uh, a political solution for Afghanistan. Um, what, at this point in time, after these many years and particularly in with the backdrop of some recent developments here from a Taliban letter, but also a guerrilla campaign that has been going on, increased intensity here in the cities. Uh, to what extent now should we be using our energy here to get a negotiation started? 
How high should this be on our priorities? Uh, and what would successful negotiations look like? What should the U.S. and Kabul government in that situation de demand? What can they demand? Uh, obviously, everyone would like to see talks begin, but most of what we've been seeing here is talking about getting talks going and very little, if any, on whether there really is the basis here for a negotiated settlement, at least at this point in time. So um, just to conclude this thought, would we be prepared? We know what we would like to see, and that is that the Taliban, or insurgency in general, buys into a pluralistic, democratic constitutional system. That's been the offer. Come sit down with us and we will we'll hammer out an agreement that we can all agree on. But within this framework, are we prepared to have the Taliban say to us, look, okay, let's negotiate, but not on your terms, on our terms. We'll tell you how we'll fit you into a Islamic Emirate. And we'll be more tolerant than we were in the past. So where are we in all of this? Ahmed? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, if you read the uh, commentary in the media, uh, let's say in the past six months, uh, almost all opinion pieces on Afghanistan start by highlighting the challenges and concluding by saying that there is no military solution, we need to negotiate peace with the Taliban. Uh, and if you do not follow Afghanistan very closely, uh, you might be just misled to believe that it is uh, the US and Afghan governments that do not want peace with the Taliban. Uh, and they are, or maybe perhaps they are not making uh, uh, enough efforts to do so. But the reality is that both Kabul and Washington over the past decade have consistently called on the Taliban to come to the negotiating table for a polit political settlement uh, to end the war. And we've seen uh, that both Kabul and Washington have given the Taliban unilateral concessions. Uh, we've seen that the Taliban have uh, used talks about talks f to increase its legitimacy and recognition. They have opened offices uh, from Qatar to Iran, and they've increased their diplomatic outreach from Russia to China. Uh, we've seen that the Karzai government, for example, released hundreds of Taliban prisoners. Uh, the Kabul government in indirect talks have offered uh, government positions to the Taliban. But what have we gotten from the Taliban is only increased violence. They have not cut ties with the uh, Al-Qaeda. And also, most importantly, they have not, up to today, agreed to sit down and talk with uh, the Kabul government because their ultimate goal remains the reestablishment of the uh, Islamic Emirate. Uh, and even recently that the Taliban spokesperson sent this letter to the American people, uh, they were talking about uh, holding negotiations with the U.S. about the withdrawal of U.S. troops, not about just making peace with the Afghan government. So, so far the talks about talks have only benefited the Taliban. They have increased their legitimacy and power, while the Afghans and uh, their international partners have not benefited them. And regarding the second part of your question, I think that uh, any, any negotiations between the Taliban uh, should be with the Afghan government. And secondly, there should be a national consensus within Afghanistan also about any reconciliation with the Taliban. Uh, I don't think that peace with the Taliban at this point is uh, realistic. Uh, they have not been willing to make peace and, or to reach a settlement in the past. Now that they are, uh, have the momentum, they are uh, controlling more territory than any time since 2001, they have even less incentive uh, to make peace. They believe in a military victory. But even if uh, they agree to a reconciliation without a national consensus within Afghanistan, that reconciliation would be a, peace, a recipe for uh, more chaos, civil strife, and a repetition of 1990s rather than a stable Afghanistan. Uh, so, so that's why we need more stability, first of all, both on the security and political fronts uh, in Afghanistan for any reconciliation uh, to succeed. Uh, 
And also there are lessons to be learned uh, from the reconciliation process during the Soviet Union after they withdrew. They pursued a similar uh, strategy <coughs> and we saw the after effects of that, that those groups who, even that some of those groups that who joined uh, the Afghan government, uh, they played a role in toppling the, uh, the Afghan government later. So I think that in my view, the best, uh, uh, the best way to approach the reconciliation issue is to have our expectations realistic, uh, to focus on, because there are two things that in my opinion could bring the Taliban to, ne to real negotiations. First, it would be that the Afghan government uh, becomes more competent, it uh, tackles corruptions and it uh, works on uh, building its institutions so that the Taliban d don't see a military victory possible. And secondly, also, it's the support network that Taliban maintains in Pakistan, because if Pakistan reverses its decision and puts pressure on, on Pakistan, that could be a game changer. Uh, but right now, I think that the best approach would be to uh, focus on stability of Afghanistan, degrading the Taliban's power, at the same time trying to peel off some of the, uh, uh, not the ideological core of the Taliban, but some of those Taliban groups that, uh, who are fighting for money, for power, for other incentives, that could be reconciled. Uh, so reintegration rather than reconciliation seems more realistic. I do, but I know I will let somebody else go first. I, I think that we, the United States, the international community involved very much into need to get into the uh, political prism of thinking about the, the conflict. Uh, that includes many dimensions to it, one of which is how do we pick targeting? What kind of leadership structures on the side of the Taliban do we want to have in place uh, to be able to um, ensure that there is in fact an interlocutor uh, who will at one point be interested in negotiating and that that interlocutor um, has the capacity to inform any sort of negotiating, uh, negotiated deal. I agree with Ahmed that right now, and frankly for a while, the Taliban has few incentives. It has many incentives to negotiate, and I think there are real reasons to engage ne in negotiations, but it has very few incentives to come to a deal. It's not going to come to a deal before the 2019 presidential elections. It will not know when any kind of deal will be viable. And in fact, if the Afghan political class handles the elections uh, as yet another protracted crisis, that will be enormously advantageous um, for the Taliban. But at the end of the day, there will be negotiations. They might, be, they might not involve the United States. We might long be gone. And there will be it might be negotiations after a tremendous bloodbath. So in, in uh, Chris was, was very uh, crucial in his comments in saying, we not only need to think about what is ideal, but also what is realistic. And it might be that we would love to have a negotiations when the Taliban is really weak and when it comes to a deal um, that we very much want to see. Those negotiations might not arrive and rather the negotiations might be after a significant civil war. Uh, the negotiations in Colombia came at a situation where there was a significant stalemate. The FARC was weakened in a way that the Taliban <coughs> is nowhere weakened but the government also maxed out its military capacity, and the government understood it. Now, the negotiations took uh, still for years. There are many issues. There is never national consensus, but one of the crucial elements uh, that a country can do, that Afghanistan must do, I would posit, in preparing for that negotiated outcome one day, is to do the healing with itself that it needs to do. It's to, to do the healing between um, the Afghan society and the Afghan government to start engaging in serious national interest behavior among the Afghan political elites. The Afghan political elite still profits and misbehaves enormously in the context uh, of the fighting. The fighting is very convenient for the Afghan political elite. And, and that's part of the issue of our staying and what kind of role do we play, at what point does the Afghan political class becomes responsible 
for um, the national interest uh, of the country. Is there, me, is, should we keep in mind that negotiations is a very broad term? You can negotiate after this bloody civil war, which Van is talking about, you can negotiate effectively the terms of surrender. Uh, the, that's negotiations too. Including our surrender. Including, yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, so I think that when we talk about negotiations, we're not, it's not bounded by the idea no. that, that somehow what it means is a trade-off. Uh, uh, there's some kind of compromise of interests. Uh, negotiations I, I, has to be, yeah, when we I, use that term, let's use it carefully. I, I think you're putting your finger on something that's very important, which is that the American no, it's not just America. The Western discussion of negotiation has been almost unbounded by any particular thought. It has been a drifting over a kind of verbal prairie in which negotiations are good. And since they are good, we should push for them. And that is almost the limitation of the intellectual effort that has gone into this. A great deal of tactical effort has gone into trying it, and almost no intellectual effort. Uh, there are some baseline questions which I will just state. I will not try to answer them. One is what kind of negotiation, if to the extent negotiation is part of our policy, what kind of negotiation is, what kind of result is acceptable? Negotiation is a tool. It's a, not a goal. It is a method of getting to a goal. We have to define what we would consider the minimal terms of a negotiation. We keep chasing a method without an objective. That has an absurdity to it. Secondly, we need to remember that no inter-Afghan agreement of the last 40 years has been kept. So if negotiation is a route to a solution, you can use it as a route to just getting out and surrendering. That's a different purpose, but at least you should know what the purpose is. But if, if you conceive of negotiation as some ending which is not simply an abandonment of American goals, then you need to talk about verification and how it will be enforceable. If we have had, ze not only have we had zero discussion of that, we have zero thought. There is no process ongoing in the federal government, nor has there been in any previous one, talking about how any form of agreement is to be verified and is to be enforced. And if you don't do that, you are just blowing smoke. Uh, Marvin, just, can I just quickly Jump add in. something? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on two issues. One, on the issue of the preconditions that um, other speakers talked about. The issue of preconditions uh, in talks with the Taliban have already changed to necessary outcomes. So there are no preconditions from the Afghan government or the U.S. if the Taliban wants to join. But those necessary uh, uh, outcomes are that the Taliban cut ties with Al-Qaeda, accept Afghan constitution, and also renounce violence and become part of the political process. And uh, in response to, the issue, uh, to your question about just can we even consider surrend surrendering to the Taliban and tolerate uh, an Islamic Emirate that could perhaps guarantee that it will not um, house Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups that would attack the United States again, I think that would be this, uh, repeating the same mistake of 1990s and expecting a different result. Because if you look at the declassified uh, documents available at George Washington University about the diplomatic engagements between the Taliban and uh, the United States uh, diplomats in, in the 1990s, you see that they give all these assurances to the US diplomats uh, that Taliban will not uh, allow Al-Qaeda to establish its bases. But we know what happened. Uh, so. How can the United States and the international community or, or even the Afghans can rely on those Taliban assurances yet again? And in terms of the civil war, this civil war, if that happens, that we let Afghans just fight each other and after that they come to a negotiated settlement, after that they become tired of war, uh, they may not become tired of war. They have fought for 40, uh, 40 years now. And, and this civil war will be much deadlier than the civil war of 1990s because the Afghans are uh, much more armed with very heavy weapons. Uh, there will be, uh, of course, fragmentation of the Afghan national army uh, uh, based on factional, regional, and uh, ethnic uh, groups. Uh, so there will not, even if, even if the United States accepts a settlement with the Taliban, uh, 
a Taliban victory and control of Afghanistan is not guaranteed. So there will be civil war, and the Taliban would need Al-Qaeda and regional terrorist groups uh, to do its war against its uh, competitors and rivals inside the country. Now, yeah, just to add to that, wouldn't you agree that unlike the 90s when one side lost and one side won essentially, the, the government ran away and the, the Taliban simply took over the cities. Uh, today, uh, Van, you've spoken on this in the past, this would be a much more chaotic s civil war because we might even find insurgents fighting against insurgents, not to mention the various factions and warlords and uh, power brokers fighting among themselves for turf, so that you have added to that the proxies of Russia and Iran and Pakistan. Think Lebanon. <laughs> think, of, think Lebanon. Chris. 87.55. If you go to Section 60 in Arlington National Cemetery and you go to Gravesite 8755, you will see Major Tom Bostic buried there, surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of American service members who have given their lives in Afghanistan. There are a lot of us here in this room that have spent a lot of time working on Afghanistan a lot of sacrifices from people in this room in Afghanistan. We have an obligation to our country, to the people who have put their lives on the line, to make sure that we get a successful outcome in Afghanistan at the least possible cost in blood, treasure, and time. And at the same time, I think we've got to we need to change the narrative on Afghanistan. We gotta stop all the hand-wringing. The progress that has been made in Afghanistan has been absolutely extraordinary. If you look at what the country was like in 2001 and compared to what it's like in 2018, it's absolutely tremendous in nearly any measure that you wish to take. Education, health, Afghan National Security Forces, amount of roads uh, paved and, uh, uh, and, and constructed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we also ought to consider that 17 years of relentless pressure, both domestically within Afghanistan and from the international community, has an effect on our adversaries. Some of those effects are, are, are for good, some of those effects are for ill. But when you begin to put all of this together, I believe that a successful outcome in Afghanistan is within sight. If we just take the blinders off long enough to see it. The 17 years of relentless domestic pressure from Afghans, pressure from the international community, the knowledge that, look, the United States is going to be in Afghanistan for a really long time. And all of the fears that my colleagues have talked about in terms of what a civil war might look like in terms of this free-for-all has actually brought the Taliban to the point where they were willing to make this statement on February 14th that said, look, America, you've said you got three interests in Afghanistan. You want to make sure there's no terrorists? that are going to attack you. You want to make sure that there's a legitimate government that represents the interests of the people, and you want to make sure that there's no drugs coming out of Afghanistan. Well, guess what, America? We are willing to help you out with that. Well, let's take it. Yep. Okay, you'll get your chance. <laughs> they say we're willing to help you out with that. And they say we need to, peace, we, we need to begin a peace dialogue, but we agree with you on these goals. Now, I tell you what. When your adversary changes, evolves their position over time to the point at which they are saying, we have no problem with your war aims, and in fact, we will help you achieve them, that's something to take very seriously. Potentially, that may be what winning looks like. Now, as, as my colleagues have said, how you go into a negotiation, what your strategy is for that negotiation, you can do really well or really stupidly. And to date, we have not thought systematically about what a peace process might look like and how to do it smartly 
so we, uh, we achieve a favorable and durable outcome that advances our interests. Do we have any other interpretations of that letter? Because uh, that letter uh, clearly was, it's a 10-page it's letter, something like that, and it, it's written with enormous sophistication here, uh, the sort of thing that we never saw from the Taliban in the past. Obviously, they understood what buttons to push here. Uh, does anybody want to comment on this? Just one point, that there's a context here. And uh, which I've made noted before. Taliban continually insist they want to negotiate with America, not with the Afghans. We have continually insisted that if a peace is to have any durability, it has to be between Afghans, and they have to ne <coughs> negotiate with each other. What you, and actually, despite Mr. Trump's rhetoric, that position has remained. They haven't broken off all contacts. But I think it is possible to see this letter in terms of a bid, another bid, to do the negotiations with the Americans, in which the final deal is essentially a deal on paper and we leave, after which, depending on your point of view, you have a, a deal that maybe meets our objectives, or you have simply walked out on the Allied government in Afghanistan before it's strong enough to stand up, and the Taliban take advantage of that situation and win a war. Either is possible. You can argue endlessly about it. But there, you can certainly look at this letter as a tactical ploy to up the pressure for the Americans to call it victory and get out. And then you have to answer the question whether you believe that the negotiation thus reached without the kind of verification and enforcement that I've talked about has value or meaning. I personally don't believe it, but that's another argument that one can have. Uh, we could also ask, who's the negotiating partner here? Uh, this is not the Taliban of Mullah Omar where someone could speak authoritatively for the Taliban. Today, I think my panelists will agree the Taliban is a much more decentralized organization, not to mention the existence of Islamic State as a player here, a player who has, is not inconsequential and has made it very clear that they have no interest in negotiations, uh, whether this would be a magnet for Taliban people who are not happy with sitting down to then align themselves with the Islamic State seems very plausible to me. So I think the point of all this is that uh, uh, we've got some apparent options here, uh, but we better be careful as we approach them. Vanna? Uh, you know, Marvin, I, I think that's the right frame to put on it. Just because one enters into negotiations doesn't mean that one makes any kind of deal. Uh, so Ron is absolutely correct in pointing out that we need to think about what are the terms that we would not accept, what are the risks, what are the consequences. Uh, there continues to be very strong appropriate reasons uh, to insist on the Afghan government being part of the negotiations. The negotiations will involve the United States. They are not going to happen without the United States, uh, but uh, we can certainly insist on the Afghan government, and we need to insist on the Af Afghan government being part of it. Uh, just because you negotiate, you don't have to accept. Um, and that, of course, applies to the Taliban. I am not so concerned about the fact that um, the Taliban is, uh, that, that the Islamic State allows for greater possibility of defection, that is bad, that's very unfortunate, that should not be the reason not to negotiate. I do think it was a big strategic mistake into which Pakistan suckered us to eliminate Mullah Mansour. Mm. And that we would have been much better off in having him in leadership today and with the letter coming with some plausibility that his endorsement might be behind it. And so uh, the, the, this goes back to my comments that we need to get away from the frame 
of our sole purpose being simply to weak, weaken and fragment the Taliban, and to, because we want them be weaker, because we think that the weaker Taliban will make better negotiated deal, or because the Afghan government will defeat it. But think about uh, targeting in what kind of negotiating partner with what kind of attitudes. Uh, or, or interlocutor, let me not use the term partner, uh, we want and the Afghan government uh, uh, should have. Baselines matter, and, and here is perhaps where I uh, differ um, somewhat with Chris. Um, you know, yes, you can set the baseline as 1990s, 2001, 2002. You can set the baseline as 2010, 2011, in fact, 2014, and think of the perspective of uh, the Taliban and what, what has happened since. So yes, they are under pressure, they are degraded to some extent, they are facing um, some fragmentation more so, but not to the point of being debilitated at all, not to the point of not having regeneration capacity. Even with the presence of IS and some of the splintering, they are still incredibly unified in comparisons with, as a military force. As a, as a military force uh, in comparison with, with many insurgent groups. Yeah. So the, the more short-term, immediate baselines are not looking so dire. But I am very concerned and very distressed when I hear Ahmed say, well, we Afghans, the Afghans, uh, we can fight for a long time. And uh, it, this is you know, at the core of my problem with our engagement, that as long as it is the United States saying, you Afghans, you should want peace. You need to engage in healing and reconciliation. We are failing. The Afghans need to say, we don't want to experience the 1990s. We don't want to fight. And then we can get into discussion. How do you have enforcement mechanism in place that a deal is not reneged on, not just by the Taliban, but by the very many actors, by the northern actors. Uh, but but I, I am distressed when I hear we can go on fighting. Well, if this is the case, then there is very little that uh, can we can I, continue doing. Can I clarify my comments? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, didn't mean, I, di I didn't say, or at least I didn't mean that uh, the Afghans, uh, they want war, or they want to war, uh, fight longer. Uh, actually, many opinion polls have showed that a majority of Afghans, they want a peaceful settlement with the Taliban. But they don't want a, uh, a peaceful settlement that comes at the cost of all the gains that they have gotten over the past 16 years. Uh, and when I said that they might not be t tired of war, I was talking about the Taliban and potential warlords and, uh, who had fought the Taliban uh, in the past, that th the fight will be between them, not, not the Afghan people. The Afghan people, of course, they have suffered a lot over the past 40 years. And uh, they are happy about some of the gains that they have, they have made. They want to sustain and build on that. And they want the support of the international community. And if the Taliban wants to make peace, uh, they, they have uh, shown all different ethnic groups that they are willing to make peace with the Taliban. But again, it is always just the Taliban that are just rejecting, re rejecting peace. And in terms of uh, the 2014, that why they just the Taliban made a comeback and became even more stronger. And again, it goes to the... Uh, premature uh, and very rapid uh, withdrawal of forces because, of course, the, uh, one of the success of the Obama's uh, surge policy was the strengthening of the Afghan security forces because the Bush administration had, uh, uh, did not pay enough attention to that. But, but still, uh, the, uh, by 2000, 2011 that the withdrawal started and uh, uh, it completed in 2014, uh, the Afghan security forces had made remarkable uh, progress in terms of uh, size and uh, capabilities, but they were still not ready to take on the Taliban by themselves. And also some of the restrictions on the rules of engagement also tied uh, the hands of the US military to just help the Afghans in terms of the air operations and others. So the Taliban changed their tactics that, for example, before they were in group of five and six, just mostly focusing on spectacular and uh, uh, suicide attacks then they could gather in hundreds and just even overrun districts and even uh, twice or three times provincial centers. Uh, so that is, that is one mistake that I think that needs to be uh, just avoided in the future. Uh, we, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let you talk, but we are running out of time and, I have, and I'm gonna have to pass over a couple of questions that I thought were, were pretty good. But I, there's one last question I wanna raise, but Chris, before I do, 
I, th I think one of the challenges that we're having as a, as, as a country wrapping our minds around this is the reason why the Taliban are interested in negotiations is coming about in a way different than we have possibly imagined. Whether it's the Trump administration or the Obama administration or the Bush admin or the uh, yeah the Bush administration, we've we've always had this this presumption this this mental model that says we are going to build capacity of the Afghan government until they achieve a position of dominance over the Taliban. We are going to put enough pressure on Pakistan to where they turn against the Taliban, and we are going to hammer away at the Taliban so hard that they are going to sue for peace. And the negotiation is sort of on the margins of their essential surrender, right? It's the battleship Missouri, it's the World War II and the Pacific outcome where we negotiated with the Japanese for whether they could keep the emperor in, uh, you know, in Japan or not. But at the end of the day, it was about Japanese surrender. We negotiated a little bit uh, on, the, on the margins. That's been our mental model. But the challenge is that the Afghan government has not yet achieved a position of dominance, and it doesn't seem it's going to happen any time in the near future. And, and it doesn't seem like Afghan politics are getting more stable over time. In fact, they seem to be getting less stable. Um, regional dynamics are not getting more stable over time, they're getting less stable. And the Afghan or the Afghan Taliban has been making territorial and population gains in Afghanistan to the point at which they've got durable internal support and they've got durable external sanctuary. In many ways, the Afghan people have, or enough Afghan people have voted to enable the Taliban to continue fielding a team and regional actors have voted to enable the, the Taliban to continue to supply that team. So this Taliban request for negotiations is different fundamentally this time because it comes from this position in which the Taliban have been under such pressure. It's not that they are about to surrender. It's that the pressure has made them change their policies over time. And the timeline says, hey, the Americans aren't going anywhere. And the Taliban say, look, we are concerned about a Syria-like scenario in Afghanistan. And so we're I willing do, to I have this overture. This. Now the question, as Ron put, is how do you go about this in a way that doesn't create a chaotic outcome, but one that creates a favorable and durable outcome? And that's the question for, uh, that's a strategy question about how you do negotiations, which maybe we can get into. And, and you know, this well, goes back to my comment, we will have negotiations. The question is where? The Taliban, to the extent that the offer is credible and we don't know how unified, uh, leadership that is behind that, but they are coming to negotiating the, uh, to the, to the proposition, perhaps with simply a tactical ruse to weaken our will, but quite possibly because they actually feel pretty confident. And it's, e it's easy enough to test all of this. It's well, easy absolutely. Enough. So, you yeah. know, we, we can, th there are some costs to negotiations, but not sufficient to avoid right. having the negotiations. That doesn't mean that we have to accept everything. Ron, you wanted to get a word in? Well, just in case it was getting too clear. Um, <laughs> let, let me just suggest that, I have, that there is a completely different alternative analysis from Chris's of what the Taliban has done. And I don't think there, frankly, is evidence to reach either one. But you have a new strategy by the Trump administration. You also have a president who is known to be somewhat flighty and who didn't really want to stay. Um, it is perfectly possible that what you're seeing in the combination of the violent attacks in Kabul against civilians and in this negotiating ploy are simply an, a tactical effort to break that policy, to get us to move in a different direction. And this is reminiscent of what the Taliban did in 2005 and 6 when NATO was beginning to take over. The Taliban was very aware of all the public discussions in the NATO European countries, how shaky some of those commitments were, the domestic opposition to going in. And so you saw a major Taliban effort that cost them a lot of casualties in 2006 to produce pitched battle, which I think the only explanation could be that they knew that they hoped that would break NATO's political will. So 
you know, maybe you're getting a shift now because Taliban's feeling pressure. Maybe you're getting a repeat of a Taliban tactic we've seen before that shows nothing of the kind and is simply an effort to break our will. Notice, notice though, that the letter comes on the, in the wake of President Trump saying no negotiations. Uh, in effect, well, almost immediately, not just a letter, the thing, what came out of this was that the onus is now on the United States as the non-negotiating party out mm -hmm. there. Uh, so what you could argue, I think, follows from wrong. This was an, an opportunistic moment in which to throw the United States on the defensive here. So I'm never going to get to my most important questions <laughs> here. Uh, I, I, it's a hopeless situation, but only for the best of reasons because we've had this, I think, uh, uh, animated discussion. So I'm going to start right down. Let, 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 me, uh, let me say first, uh, please uh, introduce yourself. Uh, one question and short, or I'll cut you off. <laughs> no, I was to this woman back here. I'll get to you, Tammy. Hi, uh, my name is Ann Rutherford, and I just needed to get into the weeds on where the Taliban is getting their oxygen that um, we had gone in as supporting the Afghans, and we were just, and they were doing the fighting, and then we went to special forces that started doing no-knock raids. So we have a lot of animosity towards America because of the, what had, Americans had done. And when we started to leave, it was, um, if they just had the, their own military, if they had their own aircrafts, you can't fight insurgents without the aircrafts. So if we just gave them an, an, um, the aircrafts, then they could support themselves. And then where is Russia in this? I mean, Russia is probably... You've supporting. got a number of questions in here. Well, yes. Let me just it was in give the an opportunity here. Anybody want to respond to this? Do you want to take a couple of questions at once? Oh, yeah, that's a, probably a good idea, Chris. Thank you. Uh, uh, over here. Hi, Doug Brooks, uh, Afghan American uh, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, my question is on the on the business community, which really hasn't it's been sort of stomped on during this whole process. But it should be the ones who are supporting the Afghan government, and should be the ones pushing for peace talks uh, and some sort of resolution and and peace with Pakistan, where they do a lot of their trade. Um, why do we completely leave, leave them out of all these solutions? Okay, one more question, David. Uh, thank you. Uh, David said, David said me, most recently I was the acting president of the American University of Afghanistan in Kabul uh, for a period of about a year, uh, ending last year. Um, I have, uh, so apologize Marvin, uh, more than one point. And uh, the first one is uh, Omid, whose comments I thought were great, made a statement that's false, uh, that the Taliban today control more territory than in time since 2001. That's a statement that was made, repeated in a Senate hearing. There is no authoritative statement to that effect. In fact, uh, from everything I've looked at, the Taliban control less territory now than they did a year ago, slightly less. Um, so uh, it's very d dangerous to repeat things that you hear that aren't authoritative. David, would you distinguish between controlling territory and influence? No, uh, controlling and influencing. They control okay. and influence less territory now than they did a year ago. The statement that they control and influence more territory now than ever since 2001 is a false statement. And if you look at it, and I'll be happy to talk to people about that. Uh, the second point about the uh, Taliban and the, and the letter and the peace process, the Taliban is, uh, is not fragmented, uh, but it has a lot of different strains in it. And one of the strains that's influencing the Taliban, I believe from what I've talked about, is that uh, talk, people I've talked to, is the Taliban's um, in internal problems with the civilian casualties they're causing. They are getting a lot of pushback from other Taliban that they are doing too much to kill people, kill innocent Afghans. And that is, I think, part of the process that's going on here. And I think it's important to realize that the Taliban are not unitary. They do have different political, uh, political factions. Uh, so I'm happy to have uh, people comment on that, but okay. thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to come to, the, short, short response, to the issue of the Taliban oxygen and, and sort of challenge the notion that if only we, get, we give more hardware to the uh, Afghan military, including uh, aircraft, and which they, of course, need air, air power, um, we won't have the same problems. 
at the core of the day, the Taliban oxygen is misgovernance in Afghanistan, the lack of reckoning that the Afghan power brokers have, and polity more broadly, has done uh, with itself. And that needs to change. That should be part of the negotiations. I was suggesting that, that the power brokers need to come to their own accountability. A lot of the negotiations is not negotiations merely or solely, or even I would say primarily between the Afghan government and the Taliban, but is among the Afghan political class and their willingness to start acting with some responsibility with national interest toward their own people. And, you know, sir, you said, why do we leave the Afghan business community? The way I would phrase it, why does the Afghan business community leave itself out? Why does it continue to benefit from the lack of rule of law, from the corruption, from the abuses of power? I would throw the, that same onus back to um, what, can be, uh, what can and what must the Afghans do for themselves? Anyone else want to come? A couple of points that weren't touched on quickly. <clears throat> yes, they, they do need, we do need to do correctly the job we did in bits and pieces and didn't do on building an army and an air force. Uh, and in fact, that's part of what policy is supposed to do. But, the, uh, but it's not a hardware delivery piece. And the other, another part of the whole corruption and governance is if the Afghan government does not cease or does not make a real commitment to a professional military rather than a politicized one, then the hardware is not gonna do any good. You're gonna just do the repeat of things we've seen in Vietnam and other places when you get inefficient leaders appointed for political reasons, you will not get improvement no matter how much hardware you give them. You asked a question about the Russians. <clears throat> the Russians have <clears throat> been moving closer to the Taliban, as have the Iranians, and both of them give as their reason, and they're fairly public about this, their concern first about the growth of the Islamic State in Afghanistan, and secondly, in some cases, the Russian suspicion that we're actually doing something to help the Islamic State to hurt Russia, very conspiratorial theory, but I've heard it from them. Um, and uh, I don't know how much they believe it, but the fact is they're worried about our collapse and or our helping Islamic State, and they are moving to get closer to the Taliban, as are the Iranians, on the belief that they are less dangerous to the Russians or Iranians than are the Islamic State. This is a really lousy position. Um, it is at least infected in part by a lot of doubts about where we are as well as where the Afghans are. So it's a hedging strategy. It's, all it's a hedging, but one's very dangerous for us. Um, yeah, uh, just about uh, where the Taliban gets its oxygen. First of all, most of the Taliban fighters, they are Afghans. So they do have some level of uh, support network inside Afghanistan. Although uh, one Asia Foundation poll uh, found only 5% uh, public support for the Taliban, but that's still a significant. Uh, secondly, uh, I think Vanda mentioned it's the incompetence and uh, bad governance of uh, the Afghan government, which uh, provides just a space for the Taliban uh, and also for those who are disgruntled to join the Taliban. Um, and third, it's also the very extensive support network that the Taliban have in Pakistan, whether they are the madrasas that they produce the fighters, or whether they are the re uh, religious groups that support uh, the Taliban, or whether it's uh, some level of state support that comes from ISI and others. So that keeps the Taliban, of course, uh, going. And in terms of Russia and Iran, uh, as Ambassador mentioned, uh, it is that uh, or, or Marvin used the a word of hedging strategy, that these countries, they are not very uh, certain about the uh, final outcome of Afghanistan. So they want to just like play both sides of the conflict. They want to have their re diplomatic relationship with the Taliban, that if Afghanistan descends into chaos and civil war, uh, then they, they have their own actors that they can secure their own, own, own interest. And uh, the issue of ISIS, uh, although I used to think that the Iranians and Russians don't believe it, they just, they're just they making this an excuse, but uh, recently I'm saying that, no, there is some, uh, uh, there is a real belief within uh, the political circles in Iran and both in Russia that uh, this, this conspiracy that U.S. is supporting ISIS in Afghanistan. So that's why they see uh, the Taliban as kind of a countermeasure to uh, uh, 
uh, fight, fight the Taliban. Russians don't want the Tal uh, ISIS to uh, gain a foothold in northern Afghanistan. Iran doesn't want them in western Afghanistan along its borders. So that's part of the puzzle. And regarding um, the issue of ta Taliban territory, uh, it, is, it is true that the Taliban uh, controlled more territory than any time since 2001, a year ago. Uh, it's only over the past six months that because of the stepped up military operations that it has not only reversed the Taliban momentum, but also it, the, uh, the Afga it also has helped the Afghans to take the initiative and, and also uh, retake some of, some of that territory. Although that territory regained from the Taliban is not significant, uh, so the Taliban still maintains. But, but at the same time, I would like to just mention that, for example, a recent BBC report that the Taliban has control or influence over 70% of Afghanistan, that could be misleading. Because if you uh, uh, measure that in terms of where the Taliban has the potential to carry out the attack, then you can argue that all of Afghanistan, 100%, that could be true. The uh, terrorist groups have the potential of even carrying attacks uh, in uh, Paris. But the ability to uh, carry out attacks in Kabul doesn't mean that they control or have influence over Kabul. But it also doesn't mean that they don't have influence on the population and their concerns about the war. Uh, they do have uh, 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 yeah, influence, of course, uh, over the population. But in terms of that, which districts, which areas that the, uh, the uh, Taliban control, if you look at that map, you'll see that still it's the Afghan government which is in control of the most of the population centers, while Taliban uh, controls areas that are very densely populated. At the same time that they can penetrate, uh, they've demonstrated even those controlled areas. On Always, the yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to take three can questions. I, I uh, you, you, sorry, Chris. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I think the whole argument's bogus. Yeah, I, I think that, I think the whole argument's look, we, we don't know exactly why the Taliban sent this 14 February letter. I offered one theory of the case. Ron offered a different theory of the case. And there is, we can test these propositions at very low cost, but with very high potential payoff. But one of the challenges is that we are not yet in a position to be able to, uh, to test that effectively, uh, unfortunately. The second is that there's, a, there's actually a cost of waiting there is a cost of delay for all the reasons that my colleague mentioned. The growing internal instability, uh, the growing external influence with various Afghan actors, the rise of ISIS, all of these, all of these issues mean that the domestic and international situation in Afghanistan is not getting more stable. It appears to be getting a bit less stable. So, and, and finally, the Taliban are not on the brink of surrender. So, when you, when you examine these issues, uh, the, the, the logic of at least testing, whether there's a, a sincere opportunity for a peace process is, is well worth the price of admission. Okay. Three quick questions, tell me, but quickly, My name is Kami Bhatt, I'm with the Kami. Pakistan Inspector, and my question is to Majidia. You said that pressuring Pakistan could be a game changer. Uh, do you really mean that uh, asking our Indian friend to pack their bag, who have put Pakistani Balochistan on fire? Otherwise, I mean in a literal sense, we've been pressuring Pakistan since September 11 and didn't change any game. Why do you think it would change the game now? Thanks. Okay, Kami, thank you. Uh, um, all the way in the back, the gal all the way in the back. Um, piggybacking off that last question, um, it seems like the chickens are finally coming home to roost in Pakistan after very many years of destabilizing or helping destabilize its neighbors. Seems Can you like, speak a little, a little, sorry, it seems like slow, the slow, violence, slow. the violence that Pakistan has propagated, excuse me, propagated in Afghanistan, it seems to be materializing on Pakistani soil now. Can you tell me what this development, um, what effect it has on uh, on Pakistan taking accountability for creating uh, this nuisance? Okay, so we got two questions here on Pakistan. Does anyone have a question here on Pakistan? You do. On Pakistan? No, no. You want Pakistan? 
No, there was something about Pakistan. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 something related. So we can have three related questions. So we don't, we're running out of time, unfortunately. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Nathaniel Depavoyas, a research intern at the Heritage Foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to Pakistan, uh, the point was made that there is uh, some strategic importance in maintaining a presence in Afghanistan to secure the potential for Pakistan uh, to destabilize and their nukes to fall in the hands of people we wouldn't want them to. So would you say perhaps that there is some utility in maintaining either a semi-permanent or a permanent presence in Afghanistan, given that fact? That was going to be one of my questions. <laughs> okay. Better? Thoughts? You know, Pakistan is a critical player. It clearly enables the Afghan Taliban. It provides multiple forms of support for including its most vicious branch, the Haqqanis, and U.S. policy has been centering on and bewildering in dissuading Pakistan from that behavior since 2001. Whether this has ranged from pressure, cajoling, cooptation, making strategic deal, moving toward tactical bargaining, toward tactical payoffs. The Trump administration has given to many Afghan hands what they had been calling for for a long time, very significantly stepped up pressure on Pakistan that can be further stepped up. I retain skepticism that the pressure will fundamentally change Pakistan's behavior. Uh, I believe that we can see marginal adjustments on uh, the part of Pakistan, but I believe there are structural limitations and crucial interests of Pakistan, crucial fears of Pakistan, uh, that simply upping up the pressure does not resolve. And then in any strategy in which we say we dial up the pain, we need to think of how Pakistan can dial up the pain back against us uh, and, uh, of course, against Afghanistan, which is not to say that we don't risk dialing up the pain, but I want us to be very clear-headed in having real, uh, really thought through what Pakistan can do back to us. I um, would love to see Pakistan all of a sudden saying, okay, let us go after the Afghan Taliban. Let us go after the Haqqanis. I'm skeptical that we will have that kind of blanket resolute uh, change in policy. I, I, I do want to say, though, that uh, the clear reason why we are unlikely to have that change in policy is because we have vital and fundamental interest with Pakistan that go apart from Afghanistan, and then in some ways are far more fundamental than our interest in Afghanistan, whether it's the stability of nuclear weapons, getting Pakistan away from the deployment of tactical nuclear weapons, reducing chance and, and, and the risk that they can just be deployed inadvertently or fall into hands that we don't want to see, avoiding um, internal weakness of Afghanistan, avoiding uh, some very difficult uh, Pakistan uh, in the military confrontation. And that's uh, both a very important lever that Pakistan has, but also a very important reality. Right. Pakistan has suffered a great deal from terrorism itself, and it has fought very hard against some aspects of terrorism. Much of the terrorism from which it suffers, however, is an outgrowth of groups which Pakistan has helped to create for other purposes. Um, it is very difficult for anybody who's been in this game a long time to be completely clear-headed about something because a lot of Americans have died and been injured because of Pakistan's support for the Taliban. If that support is allowed to continue, permitted, infinitesimal, or can't be stopped, then I think ultimately we're probably going to fail in Afghanistan. The level of pressure which it would take to change Pakistan <clears throat> is going to be extraordinarily high and may put at risk our other interests. <clears throat> we have to be very clear about that. I think we also have to understand that any 
first of all, any policy of pressure on Pakistan has to be accompanied by a credible belief that some level of Pakistan's interest can be accommodated by a changed policy. You, you can't just do it out of a stick. And part of that is the question of whether we're willing to stick with a very long process in Afghanistan, because if we're not, then you just circle back to the fact that Pakistan's interests will almost compel it to keep its policy. And then you get to the point that neither to Afghans nor to Pakistanis can we prove that we're going to stay unless we stay. This isn't, you can't do this with, I'm not arguing now whether you should or should not. I'm just saying that if you want, if, if staying is a part of credibility, then you can only do it by staying. Because words have now been totally devalued in the context of multiple policy discussions. You, you can't think about leaving and prove you're gonna stay. So we may fail that test. It's not an argument for doing something, it's just an observation that if we're going to put pressure on Pakistan, if we're going to push for changes in Afghanistan, if we're going to demand changes out of the Afghan leadership, then we will have to be resolute for a long time, uh, and we will probably have a succession of crises with Pakistan, because things are going to get a lot worse, and it's going to go on for a long time, and we're going to have some success, some major crises with the Afghans. And Vonda raised this question of what happens in the election. Um, I think there are going to be places where we will have to be prepared to leave, particularly if there's, if there's a crisis like 2014 in the next election. We cannot succeed if we facilitate Afghan politicians in playing political games over the future of their country. So if, when, at some point, we get to some major crisis like that, I think we're going to have to be prepared to say, if you can't settle it, we are leaving. We have now you have now demonstrated this policy cannot work. And if we haven't made up our minds to that, then we will fail that test. Is there in this, though, a presumption here that Pakistan really is the key? Uh, as you describe it here, there's enough you know, you know, we used to talk about a two-key approach to nuclear. Okay. I think we have a two-key approach yeah. here. Okay. One is Pakistan. If you continue to facilitate the sanctuaries, I think it's very difficult to conceive of how you can reach the kind of situation we but, want. But, Ron, but the other is Afghan performance. That's the second right. key. If you don't get that, no, okay. then even Pakistan right. change won't help. Okay. Good. Uh, I'll just um, clarify my comments because yeah. the remarks that you attributed to me, I didn't say that. I didn't mention about Indian role. I didn't say that bringing India to Afghanistan and putting pressure in Pakistan will be a game changer. What I did say was exactly what Ambassador Newman just uh, mentioned. Um, I, uh, it was, the talk was about uh, just the potential of negotiations with the Taliban. And I believe that the Taliban uh, what might br may bring the Taliban uh, to the negotiating table and change their calculus about the uh, uh, outcome of war would be two things. One would be that uh, the, Afga the Afghans just take the, uh, keep their acts together. They um, improve governance, uh, build their institutions, uh, join hands to tackle the problems instead of just political bickering, and other corruption and other problems in Afghanistan. And seek that so that the Taliban don't see a military victory, uh, a possibility. And the second, I said, would be that if Ch Pakistan reverses its policy of uh, supporting the, uh, the Taliban and also deny the Taliban leadership sanctuary uh, and also take action against state and non-state actors that provide some level of support to the Taliban, I said these two uh, items will be a game changer. Okay. That last question, though, oh, we, okay. really, we really, yeah, because. Please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to You got to just signal. Oh, sorry. The Taliban already don't believe they're going to achieve a military victory. They've figured that out. Um, and yeah, it, it absolutely is true. And they've also figured out that we're going to be there for a long time. That, uh, and, and that, um, you know, there's consequences to this, this sort of serious style civil war. At the same time, the idea of a deal, negotiating a deal, deal is a four letter word. And we shouldn't repeat the mistakes of the Peshawar Accords in 1992 and the Islamabad Accords in 1993, where there is a power sharing deal that ended in civil war. Instead, we, 
need to think maybe differently about how a peace process might be structured, and I'll offer three threes. Um, this conflict is fought on three levels, an international level, that involves us and you know, Russia and other, other actors. There is a regional level, Afghan, Pakistan, India, uh, Iran, the neighbors, and then there's a national level, Afghanistan, government versus Taliban, um, ISIS, et cetera. A peace process has got to hit these three levels and ought to go in three steps. Dialogue and confidence building measures to test the sincerity of different partners and get to a, an agreement at least on an agenda for talks. Second step is uh, discussions toward a reductions in military violence towards a ceasefire. And third and finally would be discussions, negotiations toward a political settlement. And the third three is third party. Something this complicated, something this complex, needs professional assistance. And, and a third party facilitator would be very helpful in orchestrating these three levels and these three steps. And this process is likely to take a decade or more, given the fact that Afghanistan's been at war for 40 years. Okay, I, I can't close off without incorporating your question somehow. Because what you're saying, in effect, is that does the United States have a reason to want to remain in Afghanistan, which is independent of all the rest here, in the sense that we've got bigger concerns than Afghanistan, and even bigger concerns than Pakistan. We've got regional concerns, because if one goes now to Afghanistan or Pakistan and elsewhere, what you hear all the time is, you Americans, you're perpetuating the war. You want, you want to remain. In fact, we hear this from Hamid Karzai, that we're supporting Islamic State why? In order to justify our remaining. Well, for some of us, that just strikes us as a come on now. But this resonates strongly in the region. The idea that the United States now has larger geostrategic reasons to want to be there. And there's China, there's conflict with, with Iran. There's naturally all the issues with Pakistan. So are any kind of disengagement, especially one where we agreed to the Taliban to walk away, uh, what does this mean here for our broader global strategy here with regard to those countries particularly that we consider uh, adversaries or potential adversaries? Uh, I've got to close it off. I'm sorry if so I got leave the leave with a question, not an answer. Yeah, okay. I, I'm sorry if I got the last word, but <laughs> I didn't. I didn't take my prerogative <laughs> before. Uh, I want to thank everyone for not only coming but hanging around for another five minutes. Uh, I think you have to agree with me that this is the kind of discussion that we should be having all the time. Uh, this is the kind I think of uh, of clashing of thoughts here, and, and we've had some of that, but also some here, I think, uh, conclusions that we could get consensus on here that we ought, to, uh, we ought to use in what we saw here as finding the best way forward. So please join me in thanking the panelists.